The first photo reporters were assigned to take pictures which served as models for the drawings and engravings that will illustrate an event. Photojournalism was born when an image or a photo piece would suffice to tell a story. Picture plus caption equals news. Photo reporters were both adventurers and witnesses to everyday events, globetrotters searching for just the right image to help people understand, and if need be, to expose facts. Jules Ittier, present at the signing of the Thousand Year Treaty between France and China, unknowingly became the first photo reporter. Roger Fenton, sent by Queen Victoria to Balaclava, photographed the Crimean War, but carefully masked the death and horror there. Photographers were present when the West was won, offering tremendous material on these unexplored territories. These photographers, scenic pioneers, provided a mythical viewpoint and were mainly concerned about the aesthetics of their pictures. The plates they used were large and their equipment was bulky and heavy. When the first transcontinental railroad was built, the courageous photographers were part of the survey expeditions, revealing a world of adventure to the general public. The people who were producing the early work were conscious that they were producing important art work. Uh, it was very carefully produced. Um, they were using techniques which were well known to artists at the time in terms of composition and work like that. They were very attentive to composition. They were very attentive to what they put into the image. Exploring the South Pole meant danger. Scott's entire crew died on their return journey. The photographs were found with the frozen bodies the following autumn. On the Shackleton expedition, the ship Endurance was trapped for 10 months on an ice pack and was eventually crushed by the pressure during the spring thaw. The photographer had no qualms about jumping into the icy waters to save some of his glass plates. Eugène Adjé meticulously took inventory of everything he found interesting in a cold, still, almost abstract world. In 1897, he began a series of photographs on the street vendors and the art of old Paris. His work gained recognition in the U.S. while he was alive, thanks to the American photographer Bernice Abbott, assistant to Man Ray, who was a neighbor in Rue Campagne Première. But Adjé still died in poverty. Alfred Steiglitz had a love affair with New York, never tiring of photographing the city. He advocated the familiar day-to-day -day scenes. Determined to defend a new art of photography, he formed a society called Photo Secession, whose quarterly publication, Camera Work, was first published in 1903. He wanted to define photography with its own criteria as opposed to painting. Steiglitz would later say about this shot taken on an immigrant ship, if all my work were lost and this photograph was all that remained, that would be fine. Jacob Rees was the first to delve into the wretched poverty of city life. His book, How the Other Half Lives, described New York's neighborhoods, and he also received the backing of then-police commissioner Theodore Roosevelt for well-needed social reforms. Like Rees, Hein, a sociologist, was also indifferent to photography as an art form. He used his camera to produce evidence and expose many social injustices, namely child labor. He also shot those who were building America, the men at work, later explaining, I also wanted to do two things, show what needed to be corrected and show what needed to be admired. In the same spirit, Dorothea Lange devoted her career to social reporting. Deeply marked by the 1929 economic slump, she wanted to publicize the plight of the Great Depression's victims. In 1935, she began working for the Farm Security Administration, created by Roosevelt under the New Deal. Her project was to objectively record the living and working conditions in rural America. Her photographs were intended to arouse public opinion to support the government's action. The subject in her modern style of reporting touched the heart and spurred people into action.
The depression, which followed the collapse of the Wall Street stock market, eventually led to worldwide economic decline. Nonetheless, photo reporting was booming, thanks to newspapers and magazines which offered images of an endangered world. Photo agencies were founded to supply the media. These agencies circulated the pictures and managed the photographers. Keystone was one of the first international press agencies. A Hungarian came up with the idea for the agency and photo services from the United States after World War I. He had two brothers and they split up the world photo production market. The Garay brothers founded Keystone Paris and modeled it after their agencies in New York, London, and Berlin. The photo reporters did not sign their work. Every shot was stamped Keystone. The modern illustrated magazine was born in Germany. Pictures alone could tell a story, and the photographers were no longer anonymous. Eric Solomon, pioneer of the candid political picture, caught celebrities and heads of state in unguarded moments. Aristide Briand nicknamed him Dr. Mephistopheles because of his two tufts of graying hair. Fellow photographer Eisenstadt is considered the father of photojournalism. Eisenstadt really invented along with his colleague Salomon, what's called in American candid photography. In other words, the photography of people in everyday life settings. Uh, he really brought that technique very much to the fore and of course was extremely well known for certain images such as the, the American sailor kissing the girl on, on VJ Day uh, in Times Square. But these are classic images of candid photography, a photography which says we will treat every subject, whether it be a prime minister or whether it be uh, a hobo, uh, a drunk or a tramp in the street, with the same approach. There's a love story between Paris and photographers. Hungarian Andrei Kertész, forerunner of the 35 millimeter format, took pictures with humanity and tenderness. In Paris, everything is true. Everything is human and everything fits. There's no acting. Everything is natural. I was born to take pictures. I didn't want to imitate engravings or paintings because I felt that the essence of photography is totally different, like another art form. Every photographer in the world wants to come to Paris on a trip and then take pictures of life here or of some corner or other in this city. Such incredible wealth. And thanks to the people who fell in love with Paris, this is probably the only capital in the world that has 150 years of photographic history. I arrived in 1928. Then, maybe four or five years afterwards, somebody lent me a camera and I started taking pictures at night. The nightlife fascinated me and I wanted to capture things then. And later I published my first book called Paris at Night. This secret world of Paris attracted me enormously at that time. I photographed all walks of life, but it was very hard because you had to be accepted first. Paris accepted Brassai, who moved in surrealist circles and lived the bohemian life with Henry Miller. He said that Brassai was a living eye. Henri Cartier-Bresson, who began his career snapping spontaneous shots for Vue and Harper's Bazaar, believed that everything had photographic value. His technique was like the dance of a bee, who, stirred by fragrances, buzzed around the nectar. I think photography means putting the eye, the head, and the heart in the same line of sight. Time is essential for me. You see a particular thing at a particular moment. When you want something, that thing will happen. You get it one way or another. You have to think all the time, except when you're taking pictures. It's about intuition. Honestly, you're overcome with joy over a particular subject, visual joy. Cartier-Bresson frees the visual subtleties in a scene and concentrates on the sidelines of an event, whether it's the first paid vacation or the coronation of George VI of England. 
what you get is the rise of what's often called humanism. In other words, a concern, a fascination with the everyday life of ordinary people, both in your, the, the same society and in other parts of the world. And that explains part of the fascination with 35mm photography, I think. It's the ability to photograph very rapidly and without any complication at all. Cartier-Bresson pulls Swing Wing, perfect images out of his Leica, decisive instance that he tries to explain, but in fact he can't and he knows it. It's talent and possibly even genius. In 1947, he created a cooperative of photographers called Magnum with Kappa, Seymour, and Roger. For them, photo reporting was a religion. Kappa emphasized his militancy and posed as a journalist in shots as intense and masculine as he was. I met Kappa in North Africa and in Italy during World War II. And uh, we uh, discussed, and he gave to me uh, his idea of finally forming an agency uh, where we would be our own bosses, because we were all fed up with being told what to do by uh, uh, editorial uh, directors. In '47, when finally the uh, <coughs> uh, Magnum Photos was formed in New York, and uh, then I was one of the five uh, uh, founder members because um, Kappa knew of my work in Africa and the Middle East. And we, at the very beginning, divided the world uh, between the four of us uh, photographically because Bill Van de Vos had dropped out and I had Africa and the Middle East and already had the Far East and India, uh, Shim had Europe, and I think uh, uh, Kappa was ambassador at large or something like that. In 1954, Cartier-Bresson was the first Western photographer to be allowed into the Soviet Union. Each image was a revelation as a once closed world finally opened up. He attended Gandhi's funeral and called himself a Buddhist angry with the state of the world. Photography is like drawing, my way of keeping a diary. Basically, if there weren't a need to communicate, to show people what you like or don't like, testify about our era, I'd have just as much fun if there weren't any film in the camera. The exciting part for me is when I'm right in front of a subject. Click. That's overpowering. Click. And I press just at the right moment. It happens in a fraction of a second, and that's the only creative moment there is. For the first time, photographers who were photojournalists saw that somebody could produce extraordinary images, images of extraordinary artistic quality. This influence has gone on until the present day. I mean, I think he is still the, by far the most influential photographer of the 20th century. In the optimistic post-war years, some publications were revived and others were born. This was the heyday of photo reporting. There was a growing need to circulate information, and photographs meant truth, impact, and modernness. From then on, every event had its pictures. In 1959, when the Cuban Revolution broke out, Daniel Camus, international reporter at Paris Match magazine, was honeymooning in the Caribbean. 
We were in Cuba covering the event. Nobody could get in because the airport was closed. We were the only reporters over there. We were able to meet Castro, who arrived in Cuba with his bearded group, his whole team. He welcomed us warmly and even gave us a revolution as a wedding present. When you're photographing something, you have to be in tune with the subject and like what you do, or else you'll never take great pictures. If you think about how much money you'll make from the picture you're taking, you may take a good one, but it will not have been your heart guiding your head. Alberto Corda worked in fashion before turning to photojournalism. He first became interested in the living conditions of Cuba's underprivileged neighborhoods and then struck up a friendship with the revolutionaries and became their favorite photographer. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry wrote a marvelous book called The Little Prince. 